I'd like to see some more people get involved in studies. Sunday morning could be at 8, 6.30 on Wednesday night, or is it 6? 6. Who's <laughs> at 6? I'd be late. All right, 6.30 on Wednesday nights. Now, here's what we're doing with foundations. Immediately next Sunday, we're starting 8 o'clock Sunday mornings. And then we're going to see who signs up today if we're going to do a Wednesday night opposite of Dick and Deeper. So make sure you look at the clipboard, see when you're available. It is a little bit of a commitment. So make sure, you know, that's something you want to do. And it's really, you can talk to anyone who's done either of the classes. Please get involved. So Sunday morning is Wednesday. If you're interested in digging deeper and you haven't been through Foundation, see Chris and I. We'll talk to you about that and what, uh, what path we can take. Because uh, there are some folks in here that have been in the church for, we won't go into how many years. But see this my house. And, you know, if, if you feel like you want to join Digging Deeper, we're going to talk to you about that. So, um, just some information on that. Next Sunday, it's already March, so it should be warming up soon. We're closer to spring. So, um, March 1st is our first Sunday of the month, so hot luck next Sunday. Lots of yummy food. And then the following Friday is Catch 419. So does that mean next Sunday we should bring our meal at church? We should bring our food to church, yeah. Raise your hand if you're going to bring food next Sunday, if you're thinking about it. Make it good. Raise more hands. Come on. Let's get some good food here next Sunday. Even if you, well, you can bring food and not stay if you can't stay. Or if you forget and don't bring food, don't worry about it. There's always plenty. So just join us for a meal. Um, then we have... Uh, Orange track racing comes up after that. We were packed in February. I expect this to be packed again in March. Uh, then we'll have Mission of Hope. The Sunday school teachers still needed folks. Uh, really cool thing happened uh, over the last few days. Uh, a church is revisioning uh, how they're going to do church. And they're selling their building and they got rid of a bunch of stuff at a, at a sale. And the Sunday school picked up the, the, two of the boxes are like this, full of crafts, and one is like a 14 or 16 gallon tote full of crafts. So there's lots of crafty stuff there for them to do now. Um, you can see Pam about that if you have any questions. Um, let's see here, I'm not seeing much else in here that's right away. Do want to let you know, March 8th, so two weeks from today, spring forward. Hawks move ahead an hour. Don't want to be late for church. Um, that's pretty much it. What's in here? Pay attention to the prayer updates. We've got a couple of a new ones. Cindy, who's upstairs doing her slides, is getting a shot tomorrow for her back. She's been in a lot of things with a bulging disc. Marty, uh, who we all know and love, was getting in or out of the truck. He was getting out of the truck. Getting out of the truck and his back just like oh, he went down. So he's at Mercy right now. He went by ambulance last yeah, night. Yeah, they took him to the ER uh, last night by ambulance. We are waiting to hear. He's supposed to get an MRI today, and they're not sure what's going to happen after that. Um, but Michelle has been keeping a surprise of what's going on. And I'm sure there's other prayer requests out there that we just don't know about. So please fill out a prayer request form, put it in the box, so that we can get you onto the prayer chain. If you just wanted it with the prayer team or just want the pastors to have that, you can mark it that way. But we want to be able to pray for you because prayer makes a difference. Would you and all agree? All right. With that, let's all Jerry, stand. Yes, dear. My daughter gets to come home Tuesday. Um, it was six weeks Friday that she's been in the hospital, and she's doing well getting stronger, and thanks for all your prayers or concerns. Amen. And we'll keep them up. She's right at the top on the, on the third of those page. So, uh, Chris is recovering. It says Chris's surgery this week. Chris is recovering. Uh, as long as you don't give him a good slap on the shoulder there, he's doing fine. We just have to, if you see him doing something that he should not be doing physically, tell me. Tell me. <laughs> because he won't listen to you. And then pray for him. All right, let's all stand and greet each other. Haters are going to hate.
much for this financial gift, Lord. We just pray a blessing, Lord. I say this to God's good and choices, God. This is good.
Our very law of design, our law for our nation from the pages of the Old Testament. Truly. And many of the principles were based on God's word. So when they're setting up these rules and rights, they follow God's word on these things. So it's not surprising that the opening words of the Declaration of Independence are this. Here's what it declares. It tells that these truths can be self-evident, that all men are created equal. And then all are endowed, that means given or fortunate with, endowed, by their creator with certain unalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's the opening of the Declaration of Independence. So our nation's forefathers found that the scriptures spoke about freedom, right? Did we hear freedom in that? And they determined that the new nation would be dedicated to creating sort of a, an atmosphere that included freedom, freedom of choice, freedom of speech, and these things. And they forced all America to be a place where freedom would be followed through with. We were talking about that this morning, freedom, some of the freedoms we have. So because of that, America has been blessed with many freedoms that other nations don't have. Lots of them. But you know one of the things, one of the freedoms we have, and even the citizens of America don't really take it. The fact is, no government on the face of the earth can enjoy the freedom from Jesus Christ that was talked about in the John. And I think sometimes we get to the place in our hearts and our minds where we forget that. Let's read. If you brought a Bible today, go to John chapter 8. If you didn't, grab one in front of you. If you don't want to do that, pretend like you're grabbing one in front of you. But remember this, God knows. Doesn't matter what I do, right? We're going to be in chapter 8, and I'm going to read 1 through 11. And what this talks about is... The forgiveness, really, this talks about the, the woman and the forgiveness of adultery. And, but I, well, here's what I want you to do when I read this. I want you to think about forgiving. Can everyone say forgiving? forgiving. Oh, come on. Forgiving. forgiving. And this can be forgiving yourself or forgiving somebody else. Are you ready? It says, <clears throat> Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered and sat down. And talked as he was speaking, the teachers of religious law. Who would that be, people? The Pharisees, right? Who knew the law better than the Pharisees? You got no answers, no reply. So the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery, and they put her in front of this huge crowd. And when she was in front of this crowd, they were all mocking her, and they were saying, Teacher, teacher, and talking to Jesus, and said, Look, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says you have to stone her. That was the law, right? What do you say? They asked Jesus. They were trying to trap him into saying something that could be used against him, but Jesus stood down, stepped down, and wrote in the dust with his finger. And they kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again and he said, All right, but let the first one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one by one, beginning with the oldest, until Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with just this woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Where are your accusers now? Did even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, Go and sin no more. So what Jesus did here is he followed the law, right? He didn't break any laws, but he did say, Okay. You're right. This is your law. This is your way. But what I ask you to do is, for the first one of you who have never sinned, call the right that person. Now hear this, because it's a significant statement about judging others. People. Jesus upheld the legality part of things. He said, whoever cast the first stone, throw one of this one. So when others are caught in sin, how quick are we to pass judgment? How quick? Because if we do that, we're acting like we've never sinned, though. My goodness, and it made me think, you know, I have a blessing when I write a, a sermon that I'm in it all week. And lots of times I'll call, I haven't late because I haven't been up here in a long time. Pastor Terry has taken on a fight uh, the last few months. Um, and I thank you. Well, I try to roll. But, you know, I'll roll things by Terry. Terry, you know, I was thinking this. And, you know, we used to communicate a lot about that, which we're getting back to now. 
But I'm thinking when something happens immediately, I point to judge that person, even me, depending on the situation. So you did wrong, you did it. Before I stop and think, how would God have me act like that? Because who's the ultimate judge? God. But it's our nature to judge. It's our nature to be excited inside when it's not about us. We're so excited that they screwed up <laughs> that we don't care. We're like, thank you, Jesus. I kind of overshadowed what I did. <coughs> what do I call that, people? I've talked about it before. Dying by comparison, which is a psych term, but I love it. Dying by comparison means when someone makes a mistake worse than me, I'm like, phew, what I did was nothing. Look what she did. Look what he did. Well, then all of a sudden, they took it off of me and put it on them. Where's God in any of those steps? And when I say, and I don't use this term mind anymore, uh, the nature of the beast, it's the nature of the beast, because it's not of God, it's not of God, who's it of? There's only two ways, people, and this isn't any hocus pocus religious mind robot. If it's not of God, it's of Satan. There is no in-between, there is no anything else. And so when someone says to me, the nature of the beast, is it really the nature of the beast? I think it is, not to forgive. I think it is the judge of the people. That doesn't mean cause and effect, you know, support them through hard times. Because it often also says in the Bible, where they didn't see God evident, they saw God pick them up and walk with them. Walk with us through our problems. That doesn't mean he's not there when we fumble. That just means sometimes he doesn't walk in front of us or doesn't guide us. He picks us up and walks with us. I'm here for you. We talked about today when they were in the desert for 40 years. Because they wouldn't, you know, we were talking this morning. Did we make a love instead of a right? 40 years in the desert, but they ate. He, he, he supplied food. He supplied drink. He said, all these things. People, when we go through issues, God's with us. Don't think he's not. But that doesn't mean we don't have to go through some junk. But you know what I realized in the last three or four or five months? He also puts people in place to protect you and guide you and pray with you. He strategically will put people in line with you. Your guilt and your shame will strategically take you away from those people because it's a disease. Shame and guilt is a disease. It's like a disease if it hurts you. It like stifles you. And then you find yourself just covering yourself, you know? I don't want to be around this person because they got to open up. Then I got to be honest. I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be honest with people. They can't know my job. Some of them mess up bad things, so it takes a long night off me. Valued by what? Say it loud. By what? Comparison. You did worse than I did. People, let's remember that God's job is to judge, not ours. Our role is what? To love. To love. To show forgiveness, compassion. Grace. Just a love on. We were told to love. How many times are we supposed to forgive? 70 times what? Okay, just real quick math. What's that? 490? Oh my God. So, if you mess up twice, three times, four times, six, six, six times, I'm done. What's God tell us to do? 400 to what? Someone's got a heck of a balance still, dude. I ain't pointing no finger. But when we go through the same situation, 15, 20 times, we're over it, amen? We shouldn't be. Don't hate that. Say, no. We really shouldn't be. But God might be putting us in line to have a different perspective on things. In the last month or two, I have seen guilt tear at a bunch of people, including myself. It kills, it steals, and it destroys. Nothing of that is God. When we're feeling so guilty, people, we don't feel people are understanding and God's, we're not open to the people God put in front of us, we run. And when we run, what do we do? Whatever, to be by ourselves, to feel better, to numb it, to not think about it, to not forget about it. Maybe we're just hollowing home for a while, stick to ourselves until we can release this guilt. No matter how many freedoms our nation gives us, it can't give us that freedom that shame and guilt that we feel. It's so hard for us to forgive ourselves. Now remember what Jesus said in John 8, chapter 34. I'll tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a sinless slave. 
If I sleep, it's in, I'm sorry. What that means to me is sin has a way of eating us, controlling us, dominating us, and really it's poison. Satan likes it. He wants us feeling guilty about things. He doesn't want us reaching out. He doesn't want us keeping. He doesn't want us loving on people that are feeling that way. God created you people. And I want you to know that Jesus can free us from that slavery that keeps us from becoming the person that God created us to be. Jesus Christ can, can, can take care of us. And I think sometimes we forget that. Because we think we're of our own ability. God created you to be somebody. So if sin is restraining, mastering, or enslaving you, Jesus can break that power over your life. He can do it, just him. The Bible teaches us that sin has a terrible ability to dominate our lives, to drag us down and destroy us. And Titus 3.3 tells us that at one time, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in violence and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, we were saved. He saved us. And not because of righteous things we had done. We didn't earn it. It's nothing that, that we earned. But because of his grace and mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewability by the Holy Spirit. Verse 6 goes on to say, whom he poured out on generously, on us generously, through Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. So that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. Does everyone here realize that you're heir to the throne? I don't think some of us do. Does everyone here realize how important we are to God? In Romans 6 17, it says, You used to be slaves to sin. Do you know what I like here where it says you used to be slaves to sin? That implies that something's changed, right? Wouldn't you say it? It says it used to be. Something's different, but what? What's different? Well, Jesus, remember, in John 8, 36, said, if the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. People, that is a promise of Christ. You accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He sets you free. You are free. You need to be free for yourself, but you need to quit feeling free. You need to, to quit having all this pain by yourself. Again, it will destroy you. They may have believed and repented and confessed Jesus as their Lord, people, but they've done something that has stripped them up. Something they believed, this was in John, that with a sin that they just couldn't handle quite handle. They believed that their sin was so bad, there's no way God's going to forgive them. Have you ever felt that bad? That you felt guilty about something that was so bad that you thought there's no way God's going to forgive them? And I've seen people where after that, you know, that disease, as it eats them, in a matter of time, starts walking away from friendships, walking away from church, walking away from the relationship with Christ. Where was Jesus when Grandpa died? Where was Jesus when my sister passed? Where was God when this happened? Where's God at 211? We'll talk all kinds of 911. Talk about all these things. Where is God standing right next to me? You took your eyes off Jesus. He didn't take his eyes off you. And oftentimes we do that with Peter, right? We get out and we're like, yeah, I'm looking at Jesus. We're focused. As soon as we take our eyes off, what happens? We take our eyes off of Jesus. And the gifts he's given us, right? Which is righteousness, love, forgiveness, grace, mercy. All this stuff that, that it's not there. We didn't earn it. But I'll tell you what, we need to use it and have it and keep it in our hearts. And know that we're worthy to have it. That we are heirs to the thrones. We are sons and daughters of the Most High. We're beating ourselves up and realize we're royalty. And royalty means that God loves us as he did Jesus, right? He wants big things for us. So these things that we're going through right now that seem so huge and that are eating us up and that are killing us, in the realm of things, in the realm of what's going on spiritually, God can remove that immediately today. Maybe not the situation, hear me now. But how you feel, your 
heart, your soul, your pain. He can take it right away and give you a fresh perspective on what's going on. Or maybe lead you to somebody that has a fresh perspective. Reach out, people. Reach out. And if you feel like, I reached out, I didn't. Reach out to her. Reach out to him. Reach out. Keep reaching out. God's going to put someone in your life that's going to make a difference. Now, Christians have this nagging question, how could God forgive me? I really messed up as a Christian. How could he forgive me? How could he ever forgive what I've done? This type of thinking is based on what? Human concept. Our mind and the way it works. That's that way of thinking. How could God ever wash this away? There's this word that's become quite familiar over the last 20 years that I can't stand, and that word is karma. So, oh, it's karma! Spell it. You know what I mean? People use this word karma. Oh, of course that happens. Look what you did. Is that what kind of works? Karma? Sorry, my. I saw a bumper sticker one time. Animal lovers, I have two dogs. But it says, sorry, my karma ran over your dog. But anyway, the word karma, people use karma. Karma, you deserve it. You got what you deserve. Karma. I am so sick of that word. If you've done good things, then you'll be rewarded with good things. This is karma. But if you've done bad and horrible things, you'll be rewarded that way and you'll pay big time. But you know how many world religions are based on the word karma? Where you can sum up a lot. Of, when I went to Mercy College, we were doing Old Testament classes to them. And they weren't using the word karma, but they were talking about the basic principles like Hinduism and Islam and some of the world religions. And I'm reading all this, it was based on karma. And I even read something in the Bible that I thought was karma. It's in Galatians. Make a note of this. Chapter 6, verse 7. It said, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sells. I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. This kind of threw my whole circle off when I'm talking about God's not about karma. But really, I want you to think about something. How surprised would you be? Where am I? What's what he's calling? If you plant a corn, I'll plant pumpkins. Wouldn't that be a little weird? Huh? Look to your neighbor and say, I like pumpkins. <laughs> now look to your other neighbor and say, I like corn. <laughs> so imagine if you planted all these rows of corn, all these rows of corn, and you projected ahead, you have your teams of kids or whoever that's going to come and be tasked. And I think I said the word right. And then you have someone that's going to pull the crop. You have all these things. And three months later, you're off to pump pumpkins. <laughs> you're like, wait a minute. What do I do now? I think we need to pay more attention to what we plant. All joking aside, what are we planting? I haven't been up here in a while, so I'm going to break a few rules. But you plant crap, you're going to have crap. Period. I'm not going to plant crap and then get these beautiful roses. Right? So I don't like to reap what you sow on the karma, but I do believe what I invest in is what I get in return. How many people here? Oh, don't raise your hand. I don't want like controversy. Let's talk about retirement. Hypers or 401 or whatever, whatever your retirement is. You put into it, you put into it. The whole time I work for the state, you know, first I complain. So it's a pretty good chunk. Later I like it. But everything you want, it's going in, it's going in, it's going in, but there's a return. There's a return in sight. If I'm not putting in Iger's retirement, what happens when I retire? Hopefully SSI is going to be around. I'm not going to get Social Security disability because I didn't pay in. Be careful what we plant. Think about what we do. Think about what we plant. And the word karma, I, I don't believe it. But I do believe what comes up in our harvest is what we plant. Does that make sense? Do you see the difference? I want you to check it out. There's a distinct difference between the word karma and what Jesus taught and Jesus' concept. So the world religions, bad karma is enough to make you go nowhere. I want you to visualize the scale. I was going to have one up here right at the time to do one this week. You know the judge scales on two sides? And I want you to visualize this. Karma is teaching that life is like this scale. 
If you do evil things and put them on one side, what happens? Life gets out of balance, right? The scale gets. So you're adding all these sins and simple thoughts and doubts and simple actions. And everything's going boom, 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 boom. So then what you want to do is you want to try and hurry and get some good things, right? Do, do, do. I opened the door. I said a nice thing. I did all these good things. Do, do. So the scale's doing this. I'm a good person. I told my wife I loved her four times today. But then I told her she was a punk. Then I told her about being a butt. Then I told her whatever. So the scale is just this eclectic thing that's always going like this. Because it's all about us, human nature, not God. So I want you to visualize this scale. Good, bad, good, bad. Now there are a couple of problems with this mindset. If you end up doing too many bad things, you're dipping the scale, too many good things, here's what happens after a while. The scale's going to break, folks. You're loading this side, loading this side, loading this side, and then bam! And then what happens? You go bam. You go out of control. Whatever that out of control is for you. Not trusting, not believing, not loving, not offering grace, mercy, love, forgiveness. You're out of control. And by then, you're like, God doesn't want me to of this. I'm not worthy. If you ask most Muslims if they're sure they're going to heaven, you know what they're going to reply? First of all, they're going to tell you, well, we love Jesus too. That's number two in our world. Hey, Amen. They're pre Christians to me. But here's what they're going to say. You say, are you going to go to heaven? Well, we don't know. We're not real confident. We don't know. That's not up to us. It's up to Allah. But they never know if, they're, if they've done enough good things because it's weighed on their good things and prosperity. Hinduism and Buddhism cling heavily to the concept of karma because they have long realized that people commit way too many needs in their lives, so they're going to come back for another life, try to do more better. I mean, this is the dust of Look them up again. I'm going to make it up. I mean, it's an overall view. But their concept is sort of extra innings. <laughs> we need extra innings. We didn't do enough good the first time. So can we come back? So they come back for another life and another life until they're finally able to pay off all the evil they've done and leave this world. The second problem with karma is that we never really remove any of the sin from it. You're not removing it. You're replacing it. Amen? You're not removing it. You're putting something else in its way. Karma teaches us that when we put bad deeds on one side of the scale, and good ones on the other, eventually it's going to break like we talked about. And that's what can happen to people who rely too heavily on balancing their spiritual scales. You know, on Sunday and Wednesday when we're praying for someone, we're doing good, right? And don't you feel better sometimes? But then by you know, Tuesday or Wednesday if we're not doing midweek, or Thursday if we're not involved in some sort of group. We're back in that place where life stinks. God's given us too much to handle. Can I tell you something? Without your eyes on Christ, you're always going to have more than you can handle. Always. Because we can't handle it all. We can't do it. Sometimes we can maintain it. We think everything's going on, right? Are we getting closer to Christ? Are we making a difference? Are we really understanding that God has our front, back, middle, side, and everything? Do you ever feel like you're placed in situations where there's no God at all? It's just a horrible situation? And you're asking yourself, where's God in this? I, I can't live like this. I can't do this anymore. But I'm stuck. You're stuck because Jesus Christ is in the forefront of people. I promise you. Replace this anger, this pain, this guilt with love and grace and mercy. You've got to get in your heart and mind that Jesus has the best for you. Even though the trials seem tough sometimes, they're no tougher than what you're going through now. Who are you lying to? They're just different. I remember the, there's a psychiatrist called Meningen. We studied Skinner when I went to school in Vegas. Uh, it's like a positive programming. It's completely different than Pat Law. Of course, he had to go through some of that psych classes, but manager once said this. He said, if patients in psych hospitals, this is a, a, a double degree psychiatrist, 
If patients in mental lockup in hospitals realize their sins were forgiven, 75 or of them would be released and okay. 75, now this was in you know, 1992 or 74, 75% of mental health patients were there because of the nominate or domination of sin. And I believe it. I saw it. They were there because life, they couldn't handle it anymore. They've done too many bad things, too many bad things have been done for them. That's what we need to do in ministry. But I realized in the last few months, the first place we need to get this concept is in our homes. With our wives, our husbands, our kids, our friends, our servants, our workplaces, our schools. Because with Christ with us, we're going to have tough days, but we're going to bring our aid in. You know why? Because he doesn't deliver anything but an aid. How many of us want to take that risk? People, I have a clue. Karma doesn't work. Do you get it? It does not work. It doesn't solve the pain or the guilt or the shame. You know why? Because it doesn't deal with the root cause. What's the cause of all the guilt? How many people like the band YouTube? too? Bono does some crazy things sometimes. I'm not sure if he's a Christian. But sometimes he'll talk like he is, sometimes not. But he said, what you put out comes back to you. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Or in science and physical law, every action is met with an equal and opposite one. And yet, along comes this idea called grace to supersede it all. God's grace, love and forgiveness, removes and replaces all sin. We have been forgiven, people. Our sins have been forgiven. Wake up. We've been forgiven. Which in my case is very good news indeed because I've been a lot of stupid stuff. Now, I don't know for sure if Bono's a Christian, like I said, but I think he nailed that. I really do in my heart. He nailed it. So much that I put in my sermon. I really, I read that, read that. I thought, you know, Bono, you got it right. How many of us have done stupid stuff? Oh, just five of us? Stop it. <laughs> Are we the five that have? <laughs> okay. How many of us have done stupid stuff? People, here's the challenge. We, you know, we can maintain our lives the way they are. We can pretend. We, we, we can fight. Because, you know, we got it together. We've been doing a lot of years, but we can submit to Jesus. That's what does. But I'm here to tell you, this church wants to get your breath, wants to get aggressive about that. We want to start more small groups. We want to be together as a family. Because the world's dealing us a lot of junk. And it's not getting any easier, is it? Or something? It gets easier when Christ is on board. Now again, Jesus comes in and changes your heart. And when you focus on Christ, you gotta keep your eyes on him, because what happens when you take your eyes off him? See? Right? We've all been there. We're all going to be there. But when we have brothers and sisters that are surrounding us, that we're given permission to say, Pete, we love you, brother. We think you're taking your eyes off the cross. But we're going to grab you and love on you and pray for you. Chris, Terry, we think you're taking your eyes off the cross. I don't think you reacted right to that person. I heard you this morning. We're going to love on each other. And you know how we're going to do that? We're going to remind you, what would Jesus do? You know, I don't want to get back to the old WWJD fad and all that, but it was kind of a cool thing at first. What would Jesus do? When I started in my past ministry, I talked about, and the race was a reminder, I used to wear church shirts that I had at Bright, and that's what I wore seven days a week. Yeah, you know, I don't know if you remember those days. Bright, Astro, Calvary, Scared, was not we're talking about 10 years ago? Right church, and it said, mm -mm -mm, church. So every time I wanted to cut someone off, flip someone off, yell at somebody, do something that was absolutely not a God, I had this big peacock emblem with a bright astro shirt on saying, all stop. Thank you. 
I couldn't be out representing that ministry. I needed those shirts. I bought, I think, 10. And I wore them for years. Right for years. But I got so sick of my good stomach. Not the ministry, because I stayed there for years. I had the shirts. But I had to wear those as a reminder of people that Jesus Christ, I wanted Jesus Christ to be my Lord and Savior. I didn't have the strength to submit everything. So I needed these reminders, which was the whole WWJD movement. The bracelets, the shirts, the, the Klingons, the car, all these. It reminded people, because let's face it, how many of you drive? Raise your hand. Okay, the cross and the fish on the back of people's car, that's a lie. That doesn't make them any nicer in traffic. <laughs> Amen? It's usually them that are cutting you off and making faces. As you see all the fishes and the, you know, yeah, okay. Who am I to do? It's not my job, not my life. So we need something to remind us that God's in the forefront. So I want you to think about today, what can we do to do that? Spray paint, I love Jesus on my back window? Oh no, because I'm so nasty. You know, is it cool? What do we do to remind ourselves that we want Jesus to be in the front of our life? Is it maybe opening the Bible in the morning? Because we don't have to prove nothing to nobody then. It's me and God. Will God forgive all of our sins? Do we deserve it? You know, in Romans 8, 32, it tells us, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things we need? People, God has already proven his love for us, amen? He sent his son to die for our sins. We were enemies while we were yet sinners. We didn't deserve that. He sent his son, the best of the best, his first, his best, to die on the cross to forgive us our sins, yesterday and tomorrow. But here's the catch. Let's look again at eight, uh, John chapter 8, 31 and 32. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said what? If you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Did you get a catch there? Did you notice something there? If you hold to my teaching. Can I tell you something? And I don't want to offend anybody, because that's surely not my goal. For those of us that warm benches on Sunday and don't open the Word, you have no idea who Jesus Christ is. You have no idea the power of the Most High God. You don't, if you're not in the Word. Now, I'm not saying you have to be in the Word 20 hours a day. Please don't misunderstand me. But like, if you see a scripture up here on Sunday, or you're going to say, write it down, go do the homework, get the Word. I'm not saying start Genesis and end it, you know, at the end of the Bible, Revelation, that's not what I'm saying. I mean, in, in the perfect world, I like to see how the Bible study, but open the Bible a little bit, read a verse or two, and, and do the homework on it. Don't just take it at face value. Don't take anything at face value. Read up. Get into the Word. No. So the truth is, the truth will set you free. The Greek word here gives the idea of remaining or abiding or hanging around. Okay? So what does it mean to hang around? The teachings of Jesus is what that means. So God made it very uncomplicated for us. Hanging around, simply opening the Bible, getting some sort of study out. God's laid it all out for us. I've read the last three months probably three books, more than I've read in here. Literally. Other than the Bible. Two and a half books. Okay. I haven't finished the three. But I'm going to tell you something. When you read a book, a spiritual book, you know, something that get you. And you're in the Word, it makes everything ever. It makes everything prioritized. It makes everything just crystal more clear in your eyes, especially in your own situation. People, we, we hold so much guilt, it poisons us. It's a disease. We have to find a way to get rid of it. And through the scripture, through God, we can do that. Lord knows we could replace. Now, let me tell you something. God made it simple. We read the Bible, get into Bible study habits. How many, raise your hand, how hard is it to get into a study habit for the Bible? Fibbers. Get this up. Lord knows we can replace some of our other habits. 
We have other habits that are bad habits. What if we took one or two of those bad habits? Or what are those two of those things that are unproductive in God's eyes and replace that with getting the Lord? Think about that. It's a, it's a mind change, right? Okay, today's the day 2500, and I promised myself because of Denny I would stretch to like 3 o'clock. But <laughs> the Bush Boys are out, so, you know, who okay. cares? But imagine that. We have all these priorities. TV, grades, and movies. All these things. And the Bible goes in the car. Until we get to church again. Or I think the Bible will work. Or it's sitting in the thing. So I know where it's at at home. I have it work, so I'm studying at work, liar. You might have opened it up once or twice this week. Can I give you a newsflash? Put one in your car, put one in your desk, put one at home. Carry your study Bible with you. My cheaper ones to keep everywhere else. It has to have There's no excuse. You have one everywhere you go. If you want to buy some cheap ones, you carry it. We're going to buy it all about. And I will. Or Jane, one of us that didn't pick them up. Get, get a few Bibles, scatter them around. But know that God loves you. He doesn't. There's nothing about your guilt that's about God. You understand that? Have I gotten that across a little bit? There's nothing godly about the guilt you're feeling. There's nothing guilty about grace. There's nothing guilty about forgiveness and love. There's nothing guilty about reaching out to someone and telling them God loves you. Send a son to die at the cross for you. I don't care what you did today. Let's pray about tonight, tomorrow. Then how much God loves you. And what's the world to know how much God loves you? People, when you get this in your heart and you see the people will see changes in you. And that's not your goal. Your goal is to change in you, right? But God. People say, what's different about you? Because your A-game's coming up. I want to end today with this. Anything that's guilty in your heart right now, anything that's eating you up, anything you're not sure of, as I get ready to pray, I want you to pray with me, or just sit there, close your eyes, leave them open if you want, whatever you're comfortable with, and ask God to remove it. That's simple. Ask God to remove what's weighing you down. Whether it's guilt, whether it's not forgiving somebody, whether it's something you've done that you think is not godly, and that God is not going to forgive you. All right, let's do that. Father God, uh, as Terry and I walk around the room, here's what I want to do, Lord. I just would like to, whatever's eating somebody up, whatever's at their, at their crawl, whether they're putting on their A face, like everything's okay or not, Lord, you know what's going on with people right now today. You know what's going on with us. You know what's going on with loved ones. Lord, our prayer as a church as a body of Christ, is that you remove that, as you remove things from me in the last few months. That you come in, Father God, and that you be the focus of everybody that hears this, that hears my voice. And Lord, that going through word, communicating with you, that life changes happen. That life changes start to happen. That people start reaching out, Lord, and just admitting that without you, they're nothing. Mm -hmm. We pray for forgiveness. We pray for love. Pull the guilt. Pull the shame. Heal this disease. Lord, we turn to you. We can heal it. Oh, how we love you. Again, Lord, heal this disease. Satan, we bind you in Jesus' name. We bind your actions. We bind your demons. There's no room for you here in our families, in our homes, in our ministries. Come, Lord, come. Lord, remove the guilt, the pain in our hearts. Remove that, that uh, not wanting to forgive. 
Let us let go of whatever it is. Holy Spirit, come to this house. And as we bind Satan, we also ask for a hedge of protection, Father God, over all of us that, that want to make this change today, that want to replace this guilt and this uh, shame and this uh, lack of forgiveness, this disease, with a desire to serve you, with a desire to put you in the front of our hearts. When we leave this house, when we hit the street, when we hit home, wherever we're going, that we're not quick to judge, we're not quick to, to put the hammer down on somebody. We don't know what their day was. Let's shine Christ to everyone we come in contact with. Lord, give us the patience. Lord, give us the strength to just shut up and shine Christ. To, to inhale God, to exhale Jesus. To make a part of our daily lives that will make everything else look trivial. We ask all this. We, we, we pray that God gives us the courage and the strength to make the difference. And Terry and I want to hear some, some life changes. Terry and I, through the, through the next year, we want to hear about people multiplying their hearts and friends sharing the love of Christ for others, showing people how to relieve the guilt, how to start a, a season of healing, to remove the disease. Sometimes, Lord, we feel like we're battling against Satan all the time, no matter what we do. We just keep trying to pedal up water. It's just up. If we just keep pedaling, we keep pedaling, we pedaling. Well, guess what? God is sending you rafts and bolts and help. You're too stubborn to see it. Because it's not the way you designed. It's not the yacht you wanted. It may be a rowboat. Take it. Lord, please come, become evident. Show us, Lord. Give us the strength to, starting today, to get more in the Word, to get to know you more, to ask more questions. So that the disease can start to heal. Because we can't help other people when we're sick. Get out of that season of feeling sick and poor me and the guilt and, the, and all the struggle. Let's, let's get a fire for Jesus, amen? Let's make changes in our life that just, that, that we feel so good because we're let go. God is healing us today. God's healing the disease. God's healing us not wanting to forgive. God's healing the guilt. God's healing the I should have, I would have, I could have. What did I do wrong? I always do wrong. Let's start doing right. And when someone falls, don't spit on them and kick them, pick them up. Throw them over your shoulder and march. I ask that you be present, Lord, in everyone's heart today. And then we see life changes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning is Pastor Christmas. Talking to us about how we can get rid of our guilt. With Christ, it's really easy because we just give it to Him. But if you go to Leviticus and you look at verse chapters 5 through 7, Three chapters devoted to sin guilt, the sin of guilt, and how to be atoned for it. So it wasn't just maybe later in the week, that very day, you went and you picked the best of the best of your livestock, and you took it down to the priest, and the priest would kill it, and then throw blood around the altar and sprinkle it on you and do all this stuff for that one guilt. And every time you felt guilty, or any time that there was guilt involved, Dad had to go do that. We talk a lot about how the Old Testament foreshadows the New Testament. In Exodus chapter 12, after God has given this to Moses, Moses goes to the elders of Israel and explains the Passover. It says, then Moses called all the elders of Israel together and said to them, Go pick out a lamb or young goat for each of your families and slaughter the Passover animal. Drain the blood into a basin. Then take a bundle of hyssop branches and dip it into the blood. 
brush that hits up across the top and sides of the door frames of your houses. I'm going to stop right there. The top and the sides. Now granted, the door was like this. The cross is like this. Same direction. And no one may go out through the door until morning. For the Lord will pass through the land to strike down the Egyptians, but when he sees the blood on top and sides of the door frame, the Lord will pass over your home. He will not permit his death angel to enter your house and strike you down. Jesus died on the cross so that not maybe here in this world, but eternally, the death angel will pass over us, and we will spend eternity with Christ in heaven, rather than separated. And this is why we celebrate that final meal that Jesus had with his disciples. Because it was the breaking of his body that's symboled by the breaking of his bread. And through that broken body or that bread being broken came the blood. This is the blood that we're talking, we were talking about in the Old Testament. He poured into the glass and said, this is my blood shed for you. Take me. This symbolizes why we don't have to do those offerings anymore. Because the final offering has been done through Christ Jesus dying on the cross for us. And as you come forward this morning to celebrate this meal with us, remember that Christ has taken it away from you. You don't have to be guilty anymore. God's taken that away. And we have people here, we stumble, we all stumble, and we've all felt guilty. The beauty of this ministry that God gave us is this ministry of reconciliation, the same reconciliation that Jesus died on the cross for. So you stumble one day, you come back here the next because we're going to love on you just as much as the day before, if not more. Because that's what God demands of us, to love him first and then love one another. Thank you, Lord, for that. Take a piece of the bread, dip it into the cup of meat. Father, we thank you for this meal. We thank you for what it represents, and we thank you that we can give you the guilt that we have and leave it there. That you will help us through it. Again, Father, help us to find the reason why we feel that guilt so we can attack that, not just gloss over it. Yes. Father, heal us. We pray this all in your precious son's name. You know, if you need to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, and today's the day to make a decision, come see Terry, all right? If you need prayer, just want us to love on you. Or share something, something we can pray about you with. See us. And always have to service, see us. See Terry and Elizabeth. Yeah, and some of our pastoral team that's not up front all the time. Come on down the center aisles. Go back against the outsides. Join us.
Great. Pull us a little closer. Pull us a little closer. Let me grow deeper. Let me go deeper in you, Father God. And deeper means just to understand what you have for us. Lord, we just pray again today that this disease starts to be healed beyond the man. That anything in us that's not of you is gone. Lord, we, we just pray. I, I love that song, the verse, Father God, just stands. Let me grow deeper. Pull me closer because we need to be closer. Lord, I pray for connections today. And I pray for connections today. Lord, be with us as we go this week, as we study this week, as we get more into you this week. Father God, as we focus more on you, as we allow this disease to be healed, go with us this week, Father God. And may we go with grace, patience, and love for everyone we go against, just as you do us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.